Hello and welcome to the video. In this video, we're going to talk about something that's brand new in iNav 1.6. Now, we've already been going through a number of videos over the past six, seven weeks looking at iNav 1.5. And as part of that, we referenced a few things that were coming in iNav 1.6. But now iNav 1.6 is here, we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about one of the huge changes if you are a fixed wing pilot and you're looking at iNav, and that is the brand new PIF controller. Now, a lot of the detail that we're gonna go through in the following slides is actually already documented in this article here. Now it's iNavflight.com slash news slash pages, blah, blah, blah. I will put that link in the description, but Constantine, who is one of the people behind iNav, has taken the time to try and explain why the PIF controller it's different from the PID controller that you're probably more familiar with. But what I'd like to do is take this opportunity to explain in a little bit more detail what the differences are between the PIF controller, where the FF stands for feed forward, rather than the PID, where D at the end usually stands for derivative, and why it's a really good idea if you're gonna be putting 1.6 on a fixed wing, and then talk a little bit at the end about some of the tips and tricks for setting up the PIFF control loop if you're gonna be popping it onto a fixed wing, which we're doing here at the moment. First of all, before we get into what PIFF is all around, let me just refresh everybody's memory about what a PID loop is. Now, we already have a video that goes through what PID loops are at a little bit of detail, so we're going to cover it at a pretty fast pace. And a PID loop is typically what you have in things like clean flight, beta flight, base flight, you name it, and also iNav as well. And it is the part of the software that is listening to where you want the model to be and where the model actually is, and then trying to get the model from where it is right now to where you want it to be in terms of angle and attitude as quick and as smoothly as is possible. And PID loops are fantastic for that as part of multirotors. But if you've watched the second half of the iNav series where we put iNav onto a plane, you'll notice that we did some wacky stuff with the PID loop to get it working well. And one of those was turning D off. So proportional is the part of the PID loop that is doing the majority of the job on something like a multirotor. And the proportional's job is to put in a correction that's proportional to the amount of error. So if you want the craft to be level and it's slightly leaning to one side, if it's only slightly leaning to one side, then the P effect is quite small. Integral is a little bit different. That is there to take care of sustained deviations over time. So you tend to see I in those places where you might be flying in rate mode and you have it maybe cranked over and it generally starts to drift up or drift down away from that position that you want it to. I is used to maintain it in that position that you want. And D predicts the behavior of these settings and reduces the settling time and increases the stability. Now the thing about these three things is they work in concert on a multi-rotor and they're there to make the craft get to your desired position as quickly and as smoothly as possible and very well-tuned craft get to that desired position really quickly and then with a minimum amount of oscillation stay in that position as well and that's what all those PID tuning videos on YouTube are all about. The thing is proportional actually acts very quickly and derivative acts super quickly. And problems that we have with a plane is that flying a fixed wing model, the way it behaves and reacts using physical things like servos and linkages and airflow is very different from something like a multi-rotor where we're able to adjust the attitude pretty quickly. So let's just look at how these things actually work on a plane. So proportional still kind of does the job you'd expect it to. So when we set up iNav 1.5 on a wing, we had a bit of proportional, we had a bit of integral, and we completely got rid of derivative. And that's because we wanted the proportional control to be pushing the control surface to where we needed it to be, and then we needed integral to keep the bank angle or whatever it is we were trying to get to on a plane at where it needed to be as well. And the proportional values were much less than you'd probably get on something like a quad because too much proportional control will actually cause the servos to jitter. So if on your plane you were using 1.5 with a PID controller and your servos are constantly chattering, then you'll probably have your P a little bit too high. So now we've looked at that, let's look at the PIFF loop. 
So again, this has proportional integral and it also has this other element. It doesn't have derivative, it has these things called feed forward. Now proportional, again, is doing exactly the same as it did before. It's making corrections in proportion to the error and it's trying to correct the error. Integral is there to make sure that sustained deviations over time are taken care of. And feed forward is actually sending the control input out to the control surface. And in a PIFF loop, the relationship between these three and the ratios of the numbers is completely different from a PID loop. Because if we put on the right hand side how we're going to choose the right numbers, proportional you don't want doing an awful lot because feed forward is going to do a lot of the work that P would normally do in a traditional PID loop. You want a chunk of integral because that integral ability to maintain the plane in the attitude that you want it to, nose up, nose down, wing up, wing down, your left, your right, whatever it is, integral is going to do an awful lot of work for you. And then feed forward is the last piece and that is going to be doing a lot of the work that you'd expect something like the proportional bits and pieces to do in a PID loop. So you're going to need a chunk of that. And the number ranges are on the screen. So proportional, you're probably going to end up something around 5 to 10. Integral, it's going to be about 15 to 25. And feed forward is going to be around 15 to 50. But we'll talk a little bit more about how feed forward can be calculated as part of a loop to make sure that you've got enough. So now if we overlay what's useful for a fixed wing model, you can see that rather than just have one thing that's very useful and something that's less useful, we now have integral and feed forward supported by proportional and in most PID loops it's kind of the other way around. So let's talk about how you actually create the number for feed forward and you tune your craft because this is something that was completely new to me and I need to say a big thank you to Constantine and the iNav team for spending time with me and helping me get my head around this. You can figure out the value of feed forward scientifically because what the feed forward number actually is is a relationship between how much the servo deflects and how much that then results in the speed of rotation of the plane on a particular axis. So for example the roll and the pitch feed forward values are going to be slightly different because most planes will roll faster than the loop. So to find the value scientifically is what you do is you set the p value to zero because we don't want p doing anything in the setup. It does mean that the craft is going to be a little lazy, but we can cope with that. Set the i value to a low value, probably 10, 15, something like that is going to be fine. And then what you do is you just check the PWM value for full control surface deflection. Now in the bits that we've already done, we set up the wing and we limited to give us about 15 millimeters of movement up and down. Now, knowing what that PWM value difference is between the maximum and minimum is very handy. So for us, 1500 microseconds is going to be the servo at 90 degrees and full elevon up is going to be, let's say, 1850 and then full elevon down as well is going to be the same in the other direction. So that means that it might be something like 1300 to about 1800 microseconds. We need to know that because we need to be able to figure out the feed forward calculation because there's a little bit, a quick little bit of math for us to figure out what the feed forward number is. So now we go out to the field, put the plane in pass through mode, throw it up. I imagine that popping something like an FPV camera on the top is going to help you get this because you'll be too busy flying the plane to try and time everything. But you need to barrel roll as fast as you can and figure out how many times or how much of a barrel roll you get per second. And similarly, you need to do a loop as well. A hard loop, you need to maximum elevator and see how long it takes to do a loop. Once you've got those two numbers, you can figure out degrees per second. So for example, if it was barrel rolling, that would, if it barrel rolled and rotated all the way around once every second, that's going to be 360 degrees a second. If it was a fast, snappy plane and barrel rolled twice, within one second, then that's going to be 720 degrees per second, and so on. So then what you need to do is divide the PWM throw. So 350 takes the servo from neutral position, 1500, to maximum deflection. If we divide that by the amount of degrees per second we've got, multiply it by 31, which is the magic number, you get exactly what the feed forward value needs to be for that axis. Let's have a look at two examples. So first of all, here's a plane that's reasonably snappy. It uh, might be something like a Night Walrus or one of those with pretty good throws or something like a Zazzy. 
for simple calculation. I'm going to assume that it takes about 360 microseconds or 1860 microseconds on the channel for the control surface we're interested in takes it to full deflection so it's actually 360 we want to remember it's the difference from middle position which is 1500 it only rotates once a second when we're doing a roll so that's 360 degrees per second so we divide 360 by 360 that gives us one multiply 31 that's going to equal a feed forward value of 31 for that axis. If we are in a plane that's really quick and hyper aggressive, something like the EF Extra that we were looking at a couple of weeks ago, that might roll twice in a second if we've got the rates really dialed up. And if we assume that we have the same throw and the same microsecond stuff at the top, then it works out at about 15.5. So it will be 15.5 for a fast, nimble plane. So the way it works is that the higher feed-forward numbers are for the more lethargic planes. The lower feed-forward numbers are going to be there for planes that are very acrobatic and very agile. The other way that you can set up feed-forward is just do it like you would any normal configuration setting. Have a go at flying it around and just see what it performs like. Again, very similar setup, set the p-value to zero, an i-value to a low value, so like five or 10, just like we did previously. Set the feed forward to about 15 to 20, which is the low end. Set the plane into angle mode this time, because you want it actually doing a bit of correction. And then get it in the air, and then put the aileron over to the maximum position. And because it's in angle, the plane will only tilt to the max angle that you've got defined. And the way it gets there tells you whether or not the feed forward number is going to be right or not. If the movement starts really quickly, then seems to almost pause and then continue slowly, your feed forward value is quite low and needs to be increased quite a bit. If you find that the move is completely smooth from where it starts to be to that max angle and it's all in one continuous movement, your feed forward value is about right. If we had to graph that out, so here we have a little graph where the position that we want is on the vertical axis. So that dotted line represents the position that we are aiming for. And the zero axis in the lower left hand side of the graph is where we're starting from. And time is over as we would go to the right. If we start with too much or perfect feed forward, we get pretty much the same result. It's better with feed forward to slightly overestimate it because you'll find that you don't seem to lose resolution or control or anything. It seems to work pretty well. So if you're not sure on the number, I would always go a little bit higher than you think you need to. The one that's easier to spot is the one we've just talked about where you haven't got enough feed forward and that's the blue line. And what's happening here is initially the feed forward is moving the servo to the maximum deflection that it can because of the number that you've got in the PIFF loop. And that gets it about 60% of the way there. And then the rest of that movement, which is that curvy bit, is actually the I component, that integral that's there to take care of sustained deviation. That's the bit that then pushes gently over time into position. So that would look like they're moving very quickly, first of all and then moving slowly for the last part into position that you actually want. And that's a classic sign that the feed forward is a little bit low. So hopefully that helps explain what PIFF is and also a couple of ideas about how you go and set it up. For a PIFF loop on a plane, you want to spend a bit of time having a go and dialing it in. You want lower P gains than you would normally expect because feed forward is doing a lot of the job. The I is quite important, so you're going to make sure that you have a lot of I. If you have too much I, you'll find that you'll get oscillation on the plane, so it's very easy to spot where that's coming from, because with a low p-value, it's only going to be I that's causing the problem. So if you have oscillations, reduce the I. And feed forward with a bit of effort, it's very easy to come up with a feed forward number and plug it in. And again, if you're not sure, go with a little bit more feed forward than you think you need, because that will still work fine. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. We try and release at least two videos a week, usually a quick tip on a Tuesday and a more in-depth video on a Friday. And sometimes we manage to get a few more out as well. If you're interested in radio control, then the playlists are useful to have a look at. Anything that's called Introduction To is an organized set of videos that teach you from first principles about the subject that you're interested in. 
but we also have information about the majority of popular open source flight controllers, how to build quadcopters, fixed wing models, reviews, setups, unboxing, all kinds of things in here as well. So if you haven't already had a look at the playlist, then I'd recommend going have a look through here to see if there's anything that takes your fancy. Finally, we do also provide updates through things like Twitter, Instagram, and also post all of our 3D designs on Thingiverse as well. So if you like what we're doing here on YouTube, have a look at those things and subscribe to us there, and you'll find out what we're up to in advance of the videos coming out here on the channel.